In the year 2000, when most people were concerned about the end of the world and Y2K, I was more concerned about my transition from high school life to college life. Okay, can I get an amen? Anybody been there? Uh, My high school was very small. I graduated with about 108 people in my graduating class, and I went to college at Virginia Tech where there was about 50,000 undergraduates the year that I went. So it was kind of going from a small town to a big school. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. My second day on campus, I'm walking around like a chicken with his head cut off, and that's when a guy named Wampus came up to me. And Wampus gave me an invitation to Campus Crusade for Christ. Now, his real name wasn't Wampus. I don't know how he got that nickname to this day. His real name is Paul Thomas. And I figured, look, if that's a guy that has two biblical names, I need to listen to what he says. And he invited me to Campus Crusade. He said, hey, every Thursday night, there's about 600 students that get together. We worship and we build community. What do you think? I said, I'm in. That sounds awesome. I need a place to connect. Little did I know that that simple invitation would change my life. Here's how it did. Uh, It was at Campus Crusade for Christ that I met a guy named Josh Kim. We would join a band together. We'd move down to Nashville in 2005, start a band, and tour for the next four years. It was at Campus Crusade uh, that I met two of my mentors that helped walk me through some really difficult situations in my college life and in the life right out of college. And it was also at Campus Crusade that I met a hot young blonde uh, that I'm about to celebrate 14 years of marriage to in two days. Sitting down here on the front row, I was playing drums. Yes, I do play drums. No, I don't play very well. And I'm pretty sure that night on Thursday, I messed up a few beats because I, all I had was that no diggity song. I, I like the way you worship. No diggity. I, I don't know if that's how it goes, but that's all I was thinking. And uh, we, of course, got married a couple years after that. But it all started, my entire life's trajectory changed from a simple invitation. It's amazing what one invitation can do and what it can lead to. Uh, Today we are in our series called Acts the Movement, and uh, we're in week four, and this whole series has really been a powerful challenge to the way that we think about doing church in 2019 in America, hasn't it? I mean, we have put everything under the microscope, and and the Acts Church is the most uh, untainted, raw version of what a church ever was. Right after Jesus ascended, Pentecost happens in chapter two, the Holy Spirit is unleashed, and so they're going fresh off the words of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we kicked this off at the beginning of June. We talked about how they were a movement of kindness and compassion. And we actually lived that out by, we, we, I think we sponsored seven or eight kids with Compassion International that morning. It was so exciting. I'm excited for those kids and their eternal destiny that's changed. So we stepped into that. Week two, we came out of Acts chapter two and Acts chapter five. We talked about how they met in homes. And we actually lived out house church. A part of that was because the listening room was rented out because of CMA week. But hey, we take lemons and make them lemonade. And so we actually stepped into house church and we met in six different homes across the city and we were devoted to prayer and fellowship and breaking of bread. And last week, we came out of Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas are in the middle of a jail cell and at midnight they worshiped and their chains broke. So who was here last Sunday as we had All Worship Sunday? Man, I believe some chains were broken last week as we worshiped, even in the middle of our hardship, if we can worship and set our eyes on God. See, it doesn't matter what your circumstance is because he's always worthy. When you can press through to that and worship God, I believe chains are broken. And today, today in week four, we're going to lean into the thing that makes the church of today the greatest form of connection on the planet. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, he once said that if Jesus is the hope of the church, I believe the church is the hope of the world. I truly believe that what the Acts Church had down and what I pray we do well here at Bridges and what churches do across this city is community, community, Uh, rooted in Jesus and existing for the world. So if you're taking notes this morning, you can write these three things down. You can also uh, follow along on our YouVersion app events page. All these scriptures will be preloaded in there for you. Write these three things down if you're taking notes. Community starts with an invitation. Uh, Number two, ministry happens in community. And number three, number three, community leads to unity. 
I was reading some of our reviews on our Facebook page earlier this week. Uh, my family and I, we got to go to Myrtle Beach for an all-paid-for vacation, and those are vacations you don't turn down, right? And so we were out on the beach, and I was just looking through some of our Facebook reviews, and I saw over and over again the word community used. About 18 or 19 reviews, and about 15 of them, the community, the community. And that's been a prayer of ours from the very beginning. We just celebrated nine months as a church plant. And, uh, man, I believe this. Yeah, God, God's worthy. You can give him some praise. That was like a golf clap there. Uh, I believe this. Look, people have a deep longing for connection. And it's only getting more and more important in our culture of anxiety, uh, depression, isolation, FOMO. Come on, it's real. I believe this. An invitation into community is a pathway out of isolation. And often that invitation into community can lead someone to discovering their purpose and their vision for life. I was recently talking to a friend who's moving to Nashville in about three or four weeks, and he wants to pursue music here, and he, he just has no idea where to start. So we went and got coffee and just kind of talked a little bit about where he was and where he wants to be. And I told him this. This is a conversation I've had often. He, he, he kind of got it backwards a little bit. I think we do this sometimes. We want to know everything. We don't want to have anything left to chance, or you know, we don't want to step into faith, but how many of you know that we walk by faith and not by sight? And so he was talking about like, man, I just need to get a job and then I'll move there. You know, I just need to find a position and then I'll move to the place. And here's what I found. If God shows you your place, you need to do that because oftentimes when you step into your place, your position will find you. And so he's coming here on a move of faith, and I said, these three things are key. Okay, when you step into a season that you don't know what's next, these three things, prayer, availability, and community. If you make those three things a priority, God will drop opportunities in your lap. Mark Batterson often says, don't seek opportunity, seek God, and opportunity will seek you. Prayer, availability, and community. See, prayer puts our first dependence on him availability shows the Holy Spirit that we're open to whatever he wants to do in and through us. And community, it surrounds us with people that are not only with us, but for us. It was an invitation in high school that also changed my life dramatically. I had a few friends, Brandon, Jeremy, and Ross, and they were all on our high school soccer team. And we weren't very good. We actually spent a lot of time on the bench, so we had a lot of conversations while the good players were scoring goals. And these three guys, they were in our high school choir. They said, Curtis, you got to join the high school choir. Our tenor section is in need of some guy power. So I never sung before in public, but that little invitation led to me joining the choir. I started getting some solos. I started writing some songs with those three guys. We joined a band. We started a band, and that led to a full-on music career. One invitation. It changes everything. You see, Jesus was the master of doing this. Jesus was the master inviter. You guys remember that the Great Commission at the very end of Matthew, the last thing that he tells his disciples in that book is the Great Commission. I like to think of it as a great invitation. It says this, Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Make disciples. In other words, invite people to follow you as you follow him. How did Jesus first call his disciples in Matthew chapter 4? He said, come and follow me. Salvation is the greatest invitation into a life with Jesus that's better than anything else. Here's Paul's version of that invite. It's in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. I think we have it on the screens here. Uh, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. You see, the Acts Church blew up because of an invite culture. On the day of Pentecost, you remember, 3,000 were added to their number. Why? Because Peter preached the message and invited them into a better life, a life with Jesus constantly. We can see the early apostles inviting outsiders into the kingdom. In Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 31, I love this story. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes uh, down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all of the treasury of the Kandaki, 
which means the queen of the Ethiopians. Now, this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. I love this. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the word invited here actually comes from two Greek words, para and kaleo, which means to call near, to come alongside. Interestingly enough, this word that we have in Greek is closely related to one of the names that we have for the Holy Spirit. It's a Greek word called paraclete. It's, it's helper. It's the advocate. It means the one called alongside to help you. You see, when you invite others into your life, you join in with the work of the Holy Spirit. That's pretty cool. Now, this moment in Acts, it makes me think of uh, Deontay. Uh, Deontay is our prayer leader here at Bridges Nashville. I'm pretty sure most of you guys know him or you've met him or that's how you came to Bridges. Uh, I think just about everybody in Nashville knows Deontay. Now, I love hearing these stories about who he's meeting and who he's inviting. And uh, in our pre-launch season, if a group of eight or nine people walked in, 99% of the time I'd say, how did you hear about us? And they'd say, Deontay. Uh, there's a hashtag, Deontay told me. And, uh, but I just love his available heart uh, to share a story and invite people into community. I asked uh, Deontay a couple weeks ago, hey, how do you meet so many people? How do you invite so many people? And he said he'll often go to a coffee house and just kind of chill out for a minute. And he'll see people doing Bible studies or book studies together. And he goes up to him and said, hey, what are you reading? Hey, what, what's that all about? That's exactly what Philip did. He goes up to the Ethiopian eunuch and he said, hey, do you understand what you're reading? See, Philip, who is being led by the Holy Spirit, Deontay, who is being led by the Holy Spirit, they were just walking down a road. But the difference is availability. And in this particular circumstance with the Ethiopian eunuch, he invites Philip into the conversation and it changed a nation. See, this this eunuch was a person of influence working directly under the queen of Ethiopia. Now, many scholars trace back this moment to the very birth of African Christianity, this little encounter on a road to Gaza with a simple invitation. Now, a little bit further into the book of Acts, there's another major invitation that happens in uh, chapter 10. There's this guy, his name's Cornelius. And Cornelius, he's a Gentile. He's a person of influence, a centurion in, in the Italian military, And he followed God. He was respected by all of the Jews in his town, but he didn't yet know Jesus. This is a wild story, as many stories in the book of Acts are, because Peter has a vision, and Cornelius over here has a vision, and it was an invitation by some of their mutual friends that brought them together. And, And Peter starts to share everything he knows about Jesus, and Cornelius is just eating it up. And as Peter is sharing, he starts to understand something, that the message of Christ wasn't just for the Hebrew people. Check this out, Acts 10, 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who were with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. You have to understand the context in this day and age because Peter crossed some major cultural lines with this encounter. Why? Because God is after everybody. God's after everyone. See, when you start to understand that it's not an us versus them mentality, it's a them needs us mentality. Sorry for my grammar there. Uh, That's when you start to step into your calling as the church. Listen, we exist primarily for those who aren't here yet. As a church, we exist for those following Jesus in here, but we exist primarily for those who aren't yet following him out there. As a church, that's our main calling. So who are you inviting into community? Who are you inviting to come closer to Jesus? You know, you're the only Bible that some people may ever read. So I pray we're a good translation, amen? People are waiting to be invited into something greater 
than what they're currently experiencing. Now, I think uh, Bridges Nashville is a great place for people to discover Jesus and, and discover community. Listen, we just kicked off our summer small groups. And I'm telling you this, small groups are the lifeblood of our church. We've got three groups meeting right now. Uh, on Monday nights, I lead a small group at the Well Coffee House in Brentwood. It's called Beyond the Message, and we go a little bit deeper into Scripture. Uh, on Tuesday nights, we have a serve group led by Steve and Karen. They serve under the bridge every Tuesday. We have a, a lunch group that goes out to eat right after Sunday service every week. It's easy. Invite people into community. And the second thing is ministry happens in community. See, Paul, the writer of the New Testament, about half of it, he never did ministry alone. In last week's message, we talked about how Paul and Silas were in the middle of a jail cell, and at midnight they worshiped, and their chains broke. Listen, I can guarantee you this. You're going to go through some hard times in life. Jesus even promised it in John 16. He said, you will have trouble in this world, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So you're going to hit hard times, but here's the deal. Although you will encounter storms in this life, how much easier are those storms to navigate when you've got other people in the boat? Paul, he had a whole crew of people. Hey, you know the quote, alone we go fast, but together we go far. Acts 17, it kicks off with this phrase, I love it. When Paul and his companions pass through, Paul and his homies he never did ministry alone. Just like David had his mighty men, Jesus had his 12 disciples, Paul had a crew of people that he did life and ministry with, and he left his legacy in those people. Guys like Barnabas, Timothy, John Mark, just to name a few. In Acts chapter 18, we actually meet a couple of unsung heroes in the Bible, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. It's fun to say. And they were married, and their names rhyme. Priscilla and Aquila. Now, Paul, uh, he became really close with this couple, and they had something in common. They were all tent makers. They all were tent makers. That's how Paul funded a lot of his ministry. So Paul's hanging out with Priscilla and Aquila, and uh, this is what I love about it. See, God will often place people alongside your journey that you have things in common with to help you accomplish the purposes that he has for you in this life. So Paul meets this amazing couple. God speaks to Paul in Acts 18. Verse 10, when he first shows up, I love this promise. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. I think that's an encouragement for some of us today. Sometimes we feel like we're in this thing all alone. Like Elijah, when he came to that point where he's like, I'm, I'm all by myself. I'm the last of the prophets. And God said, no, no, you're not. There's still a whole slew of prophets over there that you don't even know about. And I love this in Acts 18. I have many people in this city. So Paul spends some time with Aquila and Priscilla, and he goes on some ministry trips with them. They sail around the ancient world, and, and then they part ways in a place called Ephesus. And Paul leaves this, uh, Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus, and he goes on to do more ministry. But guess what church would launch in Ephesus? Yeah, the Ephesians. And they started it. You see, when you have people that you can do ministry with and, and pour into, then legacy begins to unfold because more people can reach more people and do more ministry. And there's a return on investment when you invest in people that you may never see on this side of eternity. But the dividends are endless. The best ministry happens in context of community. And the last thing is this. A community will always lead to unity. One of our core values here at Bridges is unity, and I pray that this church, oh, I pray that we're, we're, we're known more for what we're for than what we're against. Can I say that again? I pray that Bridges Nashville is known more for what we're for than what we're against. In a world that seems more divisive than ever, we need to promote a culture that says we're better together. I believe the kingdom of heaven is collaboration over competition. That's something that's hard to get into town where we've all, we've all heard dog eat dog, right? Survival of the fittest, whether it comes to music or whatever career path you choose. But the kingdom is collaboration over competition. Let's be known more for what we're for than what we're against. I think the natural tendency when we, when we hear that is we think, well, if you're for this, then you're automatically against this over here. 
And let me kind of just put a, a little bit of a magnifying glass on this. Last, uh, a couple weeks ago, we did house church for the very first time. We met in homes across the city. But listen, just because we did house church and we'll do it again as a part of our rhythm because we feel called to that doesn't mean anything that we're against mega churches. Right? Does that make sense? Just because we're all about house church doesn't mean we're against. I love mega churches. I've been a part of them. I've gone to them. And any church that preaches the name of Jesus, I can get behind that. If there's a church out there that helps people discover the love of God, this may be a shock to you, but we're not the only church in Nashville. No, but I pray that if you feel called to this church, that you would dive headfirst into community. If you're not, I know there's a church out there for you. It's the same with styles of worship, right? Uh, hymns aren't necessarily better than rock and roll worship. Uh, TED Talk messages aren't any better than a three-hour-long message. They can both be anointed. There are all different kinds of churches because there's all different kinds of people. There's a reason Jesus didn't give us a 10-point blueprint for how to do church in the Bible. No, because there's not just one way to find Jesus. And Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 9, 21 and 22. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. And to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I've become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. Know your context. See, unity was so vital in the early church. The apostles, they had to fight for it because there were so many arguments happening. There were a lot of opinions forming on in the early church. you got to remember there's no blueprints, there's no manuals, there's no conferences. These were just ordinary men that had been with Jesus. Remember that verse we had a couple weeks ago? Ordinary men that had been with Jesus, being led by the Spirit and rooted in prayer. Some of the leaders in this early church, they were still about living according to the old law and the religion and not by relationship. And in Acts chapter 15, we read about a council that gets together at Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a major city of influence. And Peter, he gets up to address the crowd. Here's what he says in Acts 15. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them, talking about the Gentiles, by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe, this is so good, it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Later in verse 19, Paul says, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Let's make it simple for people to follow Jesus. Yes, you will have to bear your cross Yes, the life of discipleship requires a lot. But let's not be a barrier to people finding Jesus just because of our personal hang-ups. Now, here's a couple ways you can promote unity. Uh, number one, lay down your need to prove a point. Does your Facebook post point people to Jesus or to an argument? And I've noticed that the same people that like you, they're not going to change their opinion. And you have the same people that won't like it, and they're not going to change your opinion. I believe in conversation over posts. Get to know people. Now, I'm preaching to myself here. Just this week, I got into a heated text conversation with a family member because I was trying to prove my point instead of trying to prove my love. And I apologized. Number two, celebrate each other and spur one another on to good deeds. Listen, you know you're over yourself when you can celebrate others. <laughs> you know you're over yourself when you can celebrate others. So rejoice when others rejoice. Weep with those who weep before each other, and that's how the love of Christ will start to saturate your life. Listen, the Acts Church was a true community of faith. And here's what I know. Community is messy. Community is hard, but it's so worth it. We weren't created to live life alone. Following Jesus is done best with a community of faith. And when you think about your faith journey and your faith story, I'm sure it involves people, right? Who invited you to church? Who invited you to that camp, to that coffee house, to that event? Who invited you to Jesus? And let me flip it. Who do you need to invite to Jesus? We exist as a church 
for those who aren't here yet. If you're here this morning, and maybe you don't know this Jesus that I've been talking about over and over again, this Jesus that's the foundation of our community, I want to invite you to start that relationship today. And then you can look around and find a community of faith to journey with. It takes a village to raise a kid. It takes a community to strengthen your faith. Let's pray. Hey, Pastor Curtis here, and I want to thank you for watching the Bridges Talk from this week. If you made a decision to follow after Jesus, I want you to email us, info at bridgesnashville.com. We're going to send you some resources, and if you're here in the Nashville area, I'd love to grab coffee with you and talk about what it looks like to be a disciple of Christ. If you are also in the Nashville area, I'd like to invite you to join us on Sundays at 10 a.m. when we meet here at the Listening Room Cafe. You can find out more about Bridges on our website, bridgesnashville.com. You can learn about joining the serve team, uh, local missions, and just supporting through your generosity. It all makes a difference. Can't wait to see you here and hear about what God is doing in and through your life. God bless.